I'm Shivani Patel. I work out of the Houston office. I've been working with simulation for about five years now, specializing in it. And today, what I wanted to go over was thermal analysis, specifically transient thermal analysis, for our FEA tools and in our CFD tools. The specific case study is, as was in the description, a model being heated up in a constant temperature oven. Those three kinds of heat transfer we can factor in either using SOLIDWORKS simulation or using SOLIDWORKS flow simulation. In this scenario, both are add-ins to the SOLIDWORKS program, so they are separate purchases. I'm going to start with the SOLIDWORKS simulation tool. I'll be using the thermal analysis module. It's in the simulation professional license. First up, uh, so if I had a new study and I hit thermal, I would get a tree looking essentially like this. It would be a tab at the bottom of my screen. To switch this over to transient, I would go to the Properties, Options tab, and switch from Steady State to Transient. It's going to be up to me what the total time is and the time increment. I based my initial guess off of about 30 minutes, so I times that by 60, I got 1800 seconds. So that's where this comes from. And then, I can choose how often it's calculating to make a, a speedy analysis. So I could say calculate every other minute and get me a result. In terms of loads, if this is in a constant temperature oven, I would say that all the outer faces of this model are a certain temperature, like so, 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Now before I can complete running this, I do have to set an initial temperature. It's in the same area. I switch from temperature to in initial. I do not select all exposed faces. I need to select the entire volume of the component for the initial temperature. So I generally use the solid bodies folder drop down in SOLIDWORKS to grab the whole part. I'll make that 60 degrees Fahrenheit, hit OK. We're basically just working off of conduction. So there's going to be a temperature distribution, some geometric characteristics, and then the thermal conductivity of the material. As we know, Thermal conductivity is different for different materials. In this scenario, uh, copper has a higher conductivity, so the ice ends up melting faster. This runs in a couple seconds, or a couple minutes, I should say. I've got the completed analysis here. We can take a look at some of the basic results and how I would interpret them. First off, I'd kind of be looking at a regular temperature plot like this, and I've cut it in half so we can see inside the model. My concern is, did the entire chunk of material get up to 400 degrees Fahrenheit in the time that I set it for? The quickest way to figure that out is to use a different version of the temperature plot where we look at the maximum value throughout the whole 1800 seconds. So I set it up for maximum, I hit OK. My plot will update and tell me that after at some point in the 1800 seconds, this does reach 400 degrees Fahrenheit. But I am curious on when that internal area did turn 400 degrees Fahrenheit. I figured that out using two different methods. First way is looking at the individual steps. This is about 300 seconds in. Um, a couple other things that I do to compare this easily. I hit the push pin, green check mark. I'm kind of stepping through the steps now. This is now 360 seconds. I also keep the legend with a defined minimum and a defined maximum. So as I compare one to one, I get an easy comparison. But this is sort of a bit manual, clicking a step, hitting OK. The other method that I do this is a numerical feedback method. Instead of seeing the colors, I would use the probe tool inside of the right click menu. Uh, you can click random spots. The best way to do this is actually use unselected entities grab the whole body, update, which is grabbing the data from every single node on this entire component, and that data will populate here, and then I'll be able to sort it by the value. So I'm looking at the max, and I'm looking at the min. As I click this very top node, I get it pointed out to the minimum temperature in the entire component, and if I hit this button right here, I can see this response over the entire time. Alrighty. 
So at a quick look at this, it does look like the 400 degrees Fahrenheit happens a little bit before the 30 minutes. So I could be overestimating by a couple minutes there. Now that is just the general temperature outputs that I would get from uh, thermal analysis FEA. Some other plot types are temperature gradient. Heat flux is an interesting one. What I want to point out here is that it's not uniform over the entire component. It is changing depending on where we are in the model. Uh, heat flux is another type of thermal load I could apply. I would right click thermal loads, choose heat flux or heat power. Basically I'm saying how much heat is being added through that face to the system. But if I'm going to add heat via heat flux, I also need to remove it through convection. Learning what the correct values are for heat flux and convection uh, is important. Uh, I can't just be guessing these numbers. I did a little bit of research in order to get a little bit closer to the proper values. Uh, using this uh, publication here. Quick overview of convection. Uh, it's very similar to conduction, but this time it's really dependent on what we call the heat transfer coefficient, or the value H. We do have some s typical standard values for heat transfer. In an oven, we're talking about generally natural convection. We might have some air flow through one end of the oven out to the other. Um, in sort of metallurgical processes, the oven doesn't generally close all the time. So we're somewhere between 5 and 25, we might be a little bit higher. Kind of based on that information, I could put in some heat flux to the system. And then I would do the exact same thing for convection. Any face that has airflow on top of it, I need to put some sort of convection coefficient. And then we run that again. What ends up happening in this scenario, uh, I don't get all the way up to the 400 the way I did before, because I kind of made an estimate on the heat flux for the oven and the convection from the oven. Um, something else that happens, instead of having a uniform outer temperature on the entire part file, there's more of a gradient. Some interesting information I can get out of this besides just how long it takes to heat up. Uh, this is the temperature gradient over the entire solid. Uh, and this actually gets me where the rate of the temperature change is the highest. So I can tell that in the thinner areas of the model, especially near the bolt holes, we're getting a higher temperature increase. Kind of based on this versus the other one, I have to do a lot of guessing with the heat flux and with the convection. And we could also factor in radiation. When we have really high temperatures in the oven, radiation is going to be factored into how fast this heats up. In thermal simulation, what we are inputting is the ambient temperature of the oven and the emissivity of the materials. i uh, got a couple standard ones listed out here. These are pretty accessible through textbooks, through papers. In general, emissivity is dependent on the material itself, the surface finish, and the temperature of the ambient air. Again, just another type of thermal load. Right now I have an object sitting in empty space getting radiated outwards or inwards by the oven. We would call this surface to ambient because I did not model the oven itself. Surface to surface would be if I was modeling a couple different parts and I also wanted to include the radiation between the parts. Anyway, surface to ambient, all exposed faces. Uh, box number one, ambient temperature. You know that, 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Emissivity. This is the emissivity of the material. We looked at a little table of that. Steel is about 0 0.2. But if I flip back to my PowerPoint, I can actually see that this is changing with temperature. These values do change. Inside of FEA, for most of the thermal loads that I can apply, I have options to vary with time or vary with temperature. If I was going to vary the emissivity, I would leave this on just a standard value like 1 activate this icon, edit, uh, and come in here and start typing in some numbers. So Fahrenheit, or I think my uh, PowerPoint over here is in Kelvin, so I'll do that, zero. What this gets me is emissivity changing with temperature, like so. Finally, this third box, it's called view factor. View factor is how much of the heat leaving a surface is going to be absorbed by another surface. When there's two objects in the oven, SOLIDWORKS will figure out for itself what that view factor is. When I was saying 
um, this is just sitting and radiating outward, it needs me to tell it what the view factor is. All the faces are radiating out to the air. The air is the oven. So 100% or view factor of 1 is how much uh, radiation is leaving this object and being absorbed. So I'd hit OK. That would be it for that, and I would run this. Of the three different studies I ran with the exact same mesh, only differing the thermal loads, this one took three to four times as long to analyze. Let's take a look at the solver messages. Um, 20 minutes compared to just a couple minutes for the others. That calculation for the view factor for radiation does significantly increase your solve time. Now in terms of results, uh, what we would see due to the radiation is a faster heat up time for the temperature and perhaps a uh, slightly different heat flux around the object. Here's the basic differences between the two tools. FEA uh, finds thermal distribution, but CFD will do a couple more result options. In terms of convection, we had to input that convection coefficient to the FEA uh, tool. CFD is automatically calculated since we just say airflow is moving over the object at whatever rate. It figures out the convection coefficient. And then in conduction and radiation, there's a couple more expanded capabilities for radiation. Um, inside of flow simulation, I'm generally using the heat transfer from the core license type. But as I talk about radiation, I will be using the advanced radiation options from the HVAC additional module. Alrighty, I've already pre-ran two studies. Uh, we'll start with the transient conduction and convection. The important thing to set up here in my general settings, I need to turn on heat conduction in solids. Heat transfer through convection is always automatically done. This is just how I include the conduction through the material itself. I do want to see transient, so time dependent, things changing over time. Some other basics, I set up a 400 degree Fahrenheit temperature for the oven, a little bit of airflow through the oven, and a standard solid material of uh, stainless steel. To complete setting up a transient analysis in flow. Just a little bit of interface changes compared to FEA. I need to go to the calculation control options. And in the finishing tab, I set how long I want to solve this for. I solve this for a little bit less time, just for speed. In the solving tab, this is a not necessary thing, but it is a way to speed up the calculation. Uh, this will default to automatic. It will choose its own time step. In order to make this all faster, you can put in your own value here. I've tested this out quite a few times, especially in CFD. I have found that if I go any higher than one second, the solution diverges very quickly. The solver doesn't get to a correct answer. This is about the max I can get. We will run this. Let's go ahead and load some results. Generally, I look at the cut plots first. These are two-dimensional versions of the fluid in the system. Let's do a section view. With this, I can kind of see that there is um, not a lot of heat up over the 100 seconds inside the solid material. I can see the airflow sort of moving over in that positive Z direction like I set it to be. I think a little bit more interesting plot is the temperature of the solid part file on the outside faces. Because this is now factoring in the convection of the air around it, the heat of the air around it, we're not making that fake assumption that all the surfaces are the same temperature. We're seeing that factored in just sort of automatically. So over 100 seconds, uh, about 73 degrees Fahrenheit on some of those faces, but not everything was changed there. Something else useful to pull from this uh, is the heat transfer coefficient. This is something that we had to input manually into the FEA. Here I can see that heat transfer coefficient drastically changes over a geometry. So having flow simulation automatically calculated makes this much more accurate. Now in terms of data that we could not get from FEA, besides heat transfer coefficient, some interesting ones are the bottleneck numbers and the shortcut numbers. This is essentially a version of heat flux. It's just being combined with a couple other parameters. What the bottleneck number tells me is where there's a lot of heat being generated in the system, but not a lot of airflow. If this was an electronics cooling board, I might be thinking this is where I'd want to put cooling lines. Shortcut number is similar. Uh, what this tells me is where there is a lot of heat flow, but also a lot of uh, speed, a lot of fluid flow. 
uh, usually a good place to put thing fins like uh, for a heatsink. That's kind of the standard basics there, just that conduction and that convection. But when we get into radiation inside of flow, we get a lot more detailed. Um, first, I would go to the general settings and turn on radiation here. This has two separate options if you have that HVAC module. So the discrete transfer is a view factor method. It's similar to what is in FEA. Essentially what you're doing is calculating a bunch of rays, leaving a surface, and SOLIDWORKS tries to figure out how many of those rays hit another object. Discrete ordinances is more accurate because it will calculate a lot more rays for certain directions from that surface instead of more diffusive. This is very diffusive, this is more focused on direction. Because it's so focused on direction, uh, we get a better prediction for semi-transparent materials. Uh, it's definitely more accurate, especially in the lower temperatures. So that standard level discrete transfer for flow simulation, best used in high temperature studies, only opaque solid materials. Discrete ordinances is always more accurate, especially when we have semi-transparent materials, when we need to factor in refraction, working with lower temperatures, or complex objects. Since ordinances is generally more accurate, I am going to turn this on. Bam. Environmental temperature, 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Is there going to be absorption in this material? Of course, it's not just radiating heat outwards. So I want to include absorption in solids. Finally, spectral characteristics. What is this? This is in terms of wavelength. Discrete ordinances can factor in how radiation would be different depending on the wavelength of that radiation. For a high temp oven, we're not seeing a lot of different waves on the UV spectrum, so I don't need to factor this in. Low temp analyses usually do not need to. That's the basics to set that up. I'm gonna go ahead and, go ahead and cancel and flip over to here. To complete setting this up, I also need to create something called a radiative surface. The way this looks, I box select all the faces in my object, and then I choose what material it is. As I'm choosing the material, essentially what I'm telling the program is what is the emissivity of this part file. Again, radiation does take a little bit longer to solve, but that three to four times longer that it took in FEA is not comparable to CFD. CFD just adds a little bit more time, maybe a couple more minutes. Ran this for about 100 seconds, similar plots. What radiation gets me is a couple more output types, starting from about here, absorption, volume, radiate, flux, all the way down to about this. The useful one in this scenario is net radiant flux, how much heat is entering this object due to radiation, not just through convection. Quite a bit more especially through certain faces. So due to this, I would actually see this component heat up faster, of course, because we're adding more heat to the system via radiation. Thank you guys so much for watching. Again, this has been Shivani with Go Engineer. Mm -hmm.